full of me. Welcome to today's program. I'm Edner Sessian, the, <coughs> the uh, director of the center. Uh, before introducing the participants for today's program on fake knowledge, knowing and the illusion of knowing, I'd like to announce the next programs. Uh, on November 18, we have a round table on American poetry today that was organized by Anne-Marie Levine. And the participants in that are Patricia Carlin, Selby Davidoff, Amy Holman, Paolo Javier, and Stefan Massimila. Then the first weekend of December, December 1 to 3, we have a weekend of programs on the uh, subject of art and science, the two culture, cultures converging. And uh, in Thank addition you? to the round tables, There'll be also other programs uh, during these two days, including videos and other uh, performances. And this was the, this this particular program on the science and art is organized uh, with another group, the Art and Science uh, Centers, Sci Art Centers. Uh, so, as far as uh, the program today, I'd like to introduce the various participants, and I will do it on an alphabetical order, so you may have to raise your hand so people know who you are. Uh, Paul Bogosian is the Silver Professor of Philosophy at NYU, director of its New York Institute and Philosophy, and member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I am going to make the bios very short if you want more information there on the website. Daniel Kahneman is Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Public Affairs at Princeton. He won the Nobel Prize in 2002 and the Pre Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2013. His work on decision making and human judgment uh, was done with uh, participation of Amos Tversky. Eric Kandel is professor of uh, university professor at Columbia University and Kavli professor and director of the Kavli Institute for uh, Brain Science. He has received uh, many, many awards and he received the Nobel Prize in psychology and or medicine in 2000. Physiology. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Physiology. Not psychology. Oh, it's, it's close enough. Physiology. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Mitten uh, is a magician uh, and one of the most curious minds I've ever encountered. Uh, his specialty is physical misdirection. Uh, Daphne. Daphna Shomani is a <laughs> professor of psychology at Columbia University's Mind Brain Behavior Institute and Department of Psychology, and she's also a member of the Kavli Institute for Brain Science. And then Stephen Sloman is professor of cognitive, linguistic, and psych psychological sciences at Brown University. He is editor in chief of the journal Cognition. And it's in reading his recent book with uh, Phil Fernback, The Knowledge Illusion, Why We Never Think Alone, that I developed the idea of doing this round table. Uh, before they start, I'd like to say that uh, after the conversation, there will be a period of question and answer. I would very much appreciate if those who come up here come with a question and uh, just focus on one question and get the answer to that question. Thank you. So the format is one of the participants will start the discussion and I think Steve wanted to get going. Um, 
I'm happy to start. It's, uh, I, I'm probably not the right person to give in this distinguished group, but um, I, I didn't know that you brought us together by virtue of having read the, our book, and so I'm, I'm really pleased by that. And uh, let me spend two minutes describing what the book's about. Um, the book has two ideas. It's, a, it's about ignorance and the community of knowledge. And the idea is that people think they know more than they do, right? So people are relatively ignorant, which, which is a claim I would defend, although that's not really the point. The point is that people think they understand simple everyday objects as well as deep, important ideas as well as political uh, policies when, in fact, it turns out they don't understand them so well. Um, and so the, the second part of the book is an attempt to explain why that's the case. Why is it that we think we understand more than we do? And the answer we offer is that people confuse what other people know with what they know. Right? So we live in a community of knowledge uh, knowledge is something that exists across people. Most thinking does not occur inside the head, but rather occurs within a community. And, not, and that's sort of the storehouse of knowledge. We outsource most of our thinking. Um, and, uh, and, and thus, we think we understand things because it's not so important to identify the source of knowledge. Right? What's more important is to gain access to the knowledge. That's the main idea. I must say the scientists I know don't quite share that view. Most of us <laughs> think we're quite ignorant and don't think we know more than we know. I wonder whether this is your shared well, feeling. Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's scientists. And, but I think that when you talk about the psychology of the public or people in general, yes, but or scientists when they're not acting as scientists, uh, then, then the situation is completely different, and people do believe. I mean, people do believe they know things that they have no idea about. And what I find most striking, and perhaps you explain it in in your book, is that when you ask somebody why they believe something, they always have something to say, <laughs> and, and and they seem to think that what they have to say, the reasons that come to their mind, are the cause of their belief which is nonsense. The, the beliefs are the cause of what they say. So the belief comes first, and, and reasons come to mind when asked, when required. And the striking thing to me is that introspectively, that's, that's not available. Uh, I, was, I was running an introspective exercise uh, this morning, I, and it, you know, fake news did remind me of Donald Trump, so we're not going to avoid Donald <laughs> Trump completely, but uh, I was very struck by the fact that I can, you know, I can hear the arguments of Trump supporters, and I don't believe for a moment that, that what they say is the reason that they believe what they believe, or what they conclude. And I tried to convince myself that the same was true of me. And I found it terribly difficult. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, found, I found that, you know, I believe what I believe because it's true. They believe, you know. They believe what they believe. Uh, so you have direct access to the truth. Absolutely. But every one of us has direct access to the truth because the experience of truth is, you know, what we have in perception. We see the world as it is. Well. And we suppress alternatives as we go. And the experience of truth is simply that you can't imagine an alternative to what it is that you see or you think. That's what's true. So that's, you well, know, we are blessed with truth all the time. I mean, two, two things about that. One of them is we hold beliefs with different levels of confidence. So perceptual things, things that are right in front of our eyes, we're very confident about. But other things we infer on the basis of the evidence, and there the inference may be shakier, and we're aware of that. I think even ordinary people are aware that their prediction about who will win the Super Bowl, you know, even if they believe something about that, is a shakier than saying that there is a table in front of us. But the important point you were making about the difference between the proffered reason, the reason that we give for believing something, versus the actual cause of the belief. It's an important distinction. However, you know, it has to be 
united with the fact that there is a distinction between the onset of a belief and the maintenance of the belief. So we, we believe something, we come to believe something at a given time, and then that's maintained. Now, when I ask you right now why you believe that, I don't know, Battle of Hastings was 1016, now, there may have been a cause for that a long time ago, but the reason you offer now may be the reason for which you maintain that belief. So, in fact, I don't believe there's necessarily a huge gap between what maintains the belief right now and what your reason is. It's clear that you are much more of an optimist about, <laughs> about the human mind than I am. I but, like to uh, be. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm on Danny's side on this one. I mean, let me bring some data to bear on the issue. It turns out there are beliefs, and then there are beliefs, and then there are beliefs, right? I'm not sure we're all talking about the same kind of beliefs. But when it comes to political beliefs, it turns out that people who feel the most strongly about things turn out to be the most ignorant about those things, right? I like to say it took me decades to learn how little I know. Well, that, that's a further issue because the ignorance, the, the question of truth has to do with the reliability of the belief. And so one of the things that really is very important to do is to distinguish between the truth of what you believe and the evidence or the reasons that you have for believing it. I thought he was making a point about the reasons, the justification that we have for believing something. You know, at the end of the day, especially when it comes to complicated beliefs, beliefs that are not about perceptual things in the environment, the most important thing you can aim for is not truth itself, but reasonable belief. What you want to do is make sure that you believe things that are as close to the evidence that's available to you as you can make them. And if you're lucky, that will also lead to true belief. I think that there's something so interesting about these sort of two perspectives mm. because it, it really sort of highlights the difference between a philosopher's optimistic perspective and a psychological, <laughs> empirical perspective that says, yes, maybe we can and should be bringing these things closer together, but de facto, people have mm. false confidence that is separate from the reliability or the truth. And I think it's that discrepancy that's, that, that you're highlighting that's so fascinating, and that we can't, and that even knowing about that discrepancy doesn't make us any less vulnerable to it. That's because we can't imagine alternatives very easily, so. Uh, but isn't there a difference between and having an idea of yourself? It seems to me if you come up with an idea, you are more convinced of it than if you read something. Use the mic, Ed. No? Uh, I'm not sure that you know that. I mean, that people are always sure of ideas because they came up with them. Uh, I don't. I don't yeah, think I, that's I, a I major. Feel the same way. I, I think, think. I think quite it's often it's the other way around. Uh, you know that that actually ideas come out of doubt. But but when we're talking, as we you know, the title invited us to talk about fake knowledge and the illusion of knowing. Uh, then we're in a different we're in a different territory, and one could admit that you know what you're presenting is is an ideal of how the reasonable man or woman or human uh, should uh, should believe and should think, and what we're tr presenting here is sort of the more empirical of course. Uh, set of facts of course. about you know, how, people, w how people think they know, of course. which is a completely different thing from how they know. We completely agreed, and, and there is, of course, a facet, and it's an empirical question. You know, philosophers, we're very good at, at sitting in our armchairs, and, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but we are very well aware of what the boundaries are of what you can get from the armchair. If you're interested, as you say, in the psychology or the error proneness of people in general, then that's heavy empirical work and it needs to be, it's actually very hard to do, I would think. People do it on the base of these surveys, which I find to be quite bad science a lot of the time. But the key thing is to bring enough distinctions to bear when you're doing that empirical study so that, you know, truth is not being run with reasonable opinion, uh, cause of a belief is not being run with how it's maintained and so on and so forth. I might offer ma cheap magic tricks as a way to think about <laughs> both <laughs> from a practical standpoint. Namely, one thing I hear people doing is conflating and basically taking all knowledge and conflating it into what's measurable and verbal, right? So then, but the moment you say that, chances are you're already in a cognitive context and you've already dismissed 
physical information and the way that a practitioner goes about crafting wood or riding a bicycle or um, or sharing knowledge in a in a spiritual community or in a psychological you know uh, self help group. So so basically, I mean, whether you want to call it mind, body, and spirit, which is very out of vogue, or you know cognitive, you know uh, sensory, motor, and um, social. Uh, certainly we have to account for different kinds of ways of knowing in these different kinds of information. And I'm not including autonomic, you know, autonomic and automatic information that, you know, we can have the best idea in the world, but if suddenly we have to go to the bathroom, we might not be able to express it to the group. You know, so there's all these different kinds of information, and it's important to think about how we, we have those ideas and verify and confirm those ideas. So, so one important distinction, I think, is between uh, knowledge that's justified by understanding the consequences of that knowledge as opposed to knowledge that's based on basic values, protected values or sacred values. So the, the motivating experiment for the study was one done, for, for the book, was one done by uh, Frank Kyle in which he, he asked people how well they understood basic common objects like ballpoint pens, and, and people felt they had a sense how they work. So he said, OK, how do they work? Explain in detail. And actually, people couldn't generate anything. I mean, people had no idea how they work. OK, but those experiments were done with drawing. And was there any, did they, were they able to isolate the problem of 2D to 3D transfer? Actually, there's a person sitting very close to us who's an expert in this, about the way that the mind is able to take three-dimensional information. Yeah. So a friend of mine who's an art teacher, he said mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive, yeah. but it's much easier pe for people to sculpt mm -hmm. than to draw, because there's less of a transfer oh, going on. So, and then also in those bicycle experiments, when they had to draw bikes, they might not have known where the handlebars are in relationship to the pedals, right. but you could have also tested them by, for instance, just the right. practical problem of, right. you know, are they able to fix a bike? Are they able to win a bike race? Are, uh, when, when the chain's off, can they put it back on or not? I mean, in other words, there's other ways that, it, and also, if other people are, if they're on a bike race with other people, I'm getting at the social, so I went through the physical, and then socially, you know, if other people's bikes are breaking down, do they mm -hmm. care? You know, so, so you can go into the same territory, but look at very different issues. Mm -hmm. And if it's only being, you know, represented in a right. like a one to seven scale, you know, which is also kind of an abstract compared to people who work with their hands and do something practical. Right. I like to consider a specific case in which a perspective was held with strong support and over a period of time weakened. So when I was a house officer at the Mass Mental Health Center in 1960, um, you couldn't get a job as chairman of a department of psychiatry unless you were a psychoanalyst. Uh, this was the standard, particularly in the East Coast and the West Coast. There were some places in between that were still skeptical. <clears throat> and psychoanalysis was the dominant mode. Uh, you know, at Harvard, their general feeling was that the reason we were not treating hypertension, asthma successfully, a lot of the diseases for which there was no treatment at the time, was that these people needed analysis. These were all psychosomatic illnesses. And psychoanalysis was the rage in the United States. It was the Chris Hartman Lowenstein generation uh, at that time. You look at the same universe now, and no one talks about this. You can't become a chairman of a department of psychiatry for your psychoanalysis. You've got to be a geneticist or something like that. And justifiably <laughs> so, I must say. Uh, and yet it's amazing how this has lost the imagination of the scientific community. So I think there is something like you know, empirical knowledge which is important in order to support the growth of a discipline. And psychoanalysis lacked it sufficiently to continue to capture people's imagination. But what I was saying that Danny didn't agree with, what I was saying that he didn't agree with is that if a psychoanalyst said, I think that asthma is caused by some difficulty you have in your relationship with your mother, he believed that. Yeah, he, he knows it. Right. <laughs> so, so, if somebody else told it to him, he may question it more. But if the idea occurs to him, it seems to have more of a power. I mean, that's interesting because I would have, I would have thought it's almost backward. 
that uh, you believe in things because you believe in the people you, you trust and love the people who believe in the That's same right. thing. So uh, I, I don't think that you invented psychoanalysis for yourself. I mean, you, you got it from somewhere, See, and you got it from people you trusted. Th th this is true. At Harvard, Greta Beebe had a tremendous influence on people in academic medicine. And she would have uh, tea for them once a week on Fridays, and she would come over and she'd convince them that what most of the patients that you're treating that don't respond to the therapies available have are psychosomatic illnesses of various kinds, and they would respond to psychoanalysis. And the internists sent their patients into analysis. And 10 years later, they saw nothing happened, and boom, the reputation of psychoanalysis dropped spectacularly. Yeah. So there is an interaction between empirical data and yeah. theoretical sure. speculation. Yeah. You know, but I, some but, beliefs but, do not disappear that, that fast. No, 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 not yeah. everything um, disappears. Yeah. But I must tell you, in my academic life, this is amazing, the change. Yeah. I, amazing just, the change. I just want to report an experience I had yesterday. Driving from Princeton, there is a big sign that says, Jesus lives beyond reasonable doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and, no. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> but, um, so I so I agree that um, you know we we rely enormously on what we call testimony, so instruction by others. You know, so much of what we believe we believe because. And I agree with Danny that you know often there's the if you if you're reading somebody listening to somebody very credentialed or reading something really credentialed and they say something you might have much greater confidence in that than if you came up with that on your own and you didn't have the supporting evidence. So, but there is an interesting question here about where things bottom out, and uh, there is the suggestion, and I think this seems to be part of the theme of your book, though mm -hmm. I haven't read it that somehow things bottom out in something called collective knowledge rather than individual yes. knowledge. And th that's a very important and interesting issue. Yes. It has to be well defined. But mm. so far, the fact that we rely on people, the fact that we rely for 90% of what we know on people, other people, doesn't mean that things don't bottom out in some individual decision about who is trustworthy and who isn't. Okay? At the end of the day, you have a lot of people clamoring for your attention, okay? and a lot of them are posing as experts. You have to make a decision about who you are going to trust. Uh, now, of course, there is the actual role of empirical evidence, which can come and smash up even the most <laughs> I like empirical experts. evidence. And that's very important. But to the extent <laughs> to which you are relying on people in your community, there is a sense in which the fundamental contribution is still made by an individual judgment about who is to be trusted. I have, a, I have a question for Steve, really, about this, which is, you know, we know, we know em empirically that we entertain false memories or connected memories in our own mind that have nothing to do with other people. I'm seeing Eric here. I saw Eric last week. I'm going to associate those events and create a rich kind of network of memories without relying on anybody else's knowledge. Do you think that that mechanism, that that process that happens in an individual's experience is a is, is the basis um, and the right. same kind of process that happens when it's other people? Or do you really think that co the collective knowledge socially is a completely different mm -hmm. kind of beast? So, so Danny wrote a book about two kinds of thinking. And I actually think that you're uh, pointing to exactly the difference between those two kinds of thinking, right? So on one hand, we have these intuitions which come very quickly and naturally, and, and our brain clearly produces those. I mean, those are internal. Those are properties of our heads. Um, when I say we think as a community, I'm referring to a deliberative process, mm. right? I love the word deliberation because it has these two meanings. One meaning is that we're thinking things through slowly. 
But the more common meaning is the sense of a jury deliberating, right? A group of people. So I would argue that right now there are thoughts that are being produced by this group of people collaboratively that no individual brain would be able to produce. And even in the domain of memory, right? Our memories are shaped by our schema, as, as any good cognitive psychologist knows. And those schema are social entities, I think, to a large yeah, I'm, degree. I'm struck with the fact that in this context, <coughs> You know, the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, uh, 1940, the highest of the high, we're having this kind of discussion. It seems to me the more appropriate discussion for the Analytic Institute is, why didn't we try to base this on an empirical level? Why didn't we go to the trouble? As in fact, the American psychoanalysts before the European invasion of Hartman, Chris, and Lowenstein were about to do, Larry Kuby, et cetera, to try to test some of these ideas. How come psychoanalysis has been so ineffective in trying to test these ideas in a more rigorous way? Why isn't an imaging facility associated with every analytic institute? Why isn't there a full-time research program associated with each institute? Here, a great institute, like the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, doesn't have a full-time research effort going on. I spoke here about 10 years ago, and I made a comment like this. And he said, you must realize Every person who is trained here must spend at least two hours a week learning about imaging. But you know what they're going to learn in two hours a week about imaging? But I know about Greek philosophy. Even less. Yes, well, I'm asking all well, of The three like, of us would, are, are collecting like data on this issue. I would like to of knowledge in a concrete context. I'm not here as a representative of the New York Psychoanalytic, so I can't answer it as, a, as, as the way New York Psychoanalytic would do. But I would say that 30 years ago, nobody would have invited you to give a talk <laughs> you did 10 years ago. Because 30 years ago, there was a conviction that what we thought and how we saw our theory explained everything, or at least explained the I, problems I, we were talking I didn't for a moment 30 years ago think so. Who didn't? I didn't. No, I'm sure you yeah. didn't. And my, my, my peers didn't think so. The psychoanalyst did. So when I was training here, there was no question that what the teachers told us, and then we developed our connected ideas about that, that we had a lot of answers. And uh, that's how we work with the patients. I think the question for psychoanalysis that is relevant is, if some of that knowledge, some of that, those findings from Freud on, and you know, a lot of what Freud said came from his head. There was no... Most of it. Right. So if that wasn't right, or if that now is proven to not fit the data, how come our patients are doing well? Psychoanalysis has helped a lot of patients. So what is it that makes it, and that's a question I have for myself, is what is the therapeutic action of what we do? It's not You don't connected. know that. It, no. You don't know whether it's related to interpretation. You don't know whether it's just being present with the person. I mean, there are so many variables that are involved here. Right. You know, but it's certainly... Marion Rudolph Goldberg was telling me recently she's trying out a situation which, in an analytic situation, rather than sitting behind the patient, she's sitting in front of the patient. Finds that in some circumstances it works better. There's so many things that haven't been looked at. It's a surprisingly unquestioning field. Aren't you flogging a dead horse here? I'm sorry? <laughs> Aren't you flogging a dead horse? I mean, haven't we all moved but, on? I, well, maybe, maybe <laughs> it can be resuscitated if we rethink it. But I think we learn a great deal by seeing why did people turn away from that? Why did they do what was clear to so many of us? And that is to ask them direct questions. Uh, I think, Eric, there is a certain arrogance of scientists that the scientific way to know is the only way. There is evidence, and then you know the truth. I happen to be a scientist, so I share that. We should know that the concept of knowing is contested. There are many people who know, you know that Jesus lives beyond a reasonable doubt. And so there are just other ways. There is revelation and transmission and, and many other ways of knowing. And science is one religion. I happen to, to be part of it. Wow. But we should really not 
We should. But don't you think one of our functions Whoa. is to help people see under what circumstances science might be helpful to moving them further? I mean, certainly the science. So you. I mean, you have Aaron Beck saying, coming along and saying, "I've discovered cognitive behavior therapy. It's so much more useful under these and these circumstances." Why not do a systematic study to see under what circumstances cognitive behavior? I mean, you're not asking me because, of course, I agree with you. Uh, the, the, the point, I think... The, the, the point, uh, that's it. That's it. It's not. Because most people know things differently, and they think is, they know. This is, our function this is, as academics is to help people I mean, see you're not, what is the better way to go. What I'm suggesting, actually, is that if the function of academics is to, is to convince people of to the value them. of science and to help them see the value of science, then it would be a good idea to have some empathy for what people think they know now in different That's ways fine. of knowing. Uh, okay. We have to start from an okay. attempt fine. to understand and to empathize okay. with I, other I, ways of knowing. Okay. I'd, I'd so add to I, that, it's mm. right. I think what you're saying, <laughs> if I'm understanding correctly, is, not, is, is A, have empathy for that, but also have a scientific understanding of what gives Absolutely. us that subjective feeling of, Absolutely. of knowledge. And how to help people move from their current position to another one. So this is a topic close to my heart. Um, I wrote a book some 10 years ago called Fear of Knowledge, which discussed... Fear of what? Fear of knowledge. Knowledge. Fear of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Fear of knowledge, uh, which was precisely about... So, you know, you just said something. Uh, you did actually a classic maneuver, which is you said something extremely radical, and then you backpedaled to something much more innocuous <coughs> that everybody could accept. And Stanley Fish, by the way, <coughs> does exactly the same thing. I wouldn't have thought you would be in that company. But the, the, the radical remark is <coughs> science is just one religion among many. Okay. This is an amazing thing. Okay. And it's not even a, a, ultimately a coherent <coughs> view. Because if you say, well, you know, I happen to be a scientist. You know, that's my favorite method. But other people have other methods. For instance, they use uh, tea leaves or they use uh, uh, alleged divine revelation and so forth to find out what's true. That's, of course, perfectly fine. That's their method. I mean, did I say that's well, perfectly you said fine? Science, you said no, science. No, I did not imply. You said <laughs> science is one religion among many. Yes. Yes, I did the, say that. The way, let, can we just, let me just, you know, the way, the way we treat religions, because we don't treat them necessarily as a source of truth, is we say people are entitled to their faiths, to their religious beliefs, okay? I, uh, well, okay. The innocuous remark is, no, look, of course, this is a privileged way of figuring out what's true. But in order to, under, to bring other people around, you have to have empathy. You have to understand yes. what, they're, what yeah. shoes they're walking in. You have, to see, you have to see something essential, which is that from the point of view of somebody who doesn't believe in science, and that's at least 30% of Americans, if not, if not more, from their point of view, science is just another religion. And, and it's useful to understand that when we are talking to people who do not share our basic beliefs about what is true and how to acquire truth, we'd better try to understand who we're talking to. Empathy is no question. But, uh, but leveling it all out by saying it's just one religion. Look, I mean, I, I wasn't leveling it all out. I was really trying to tell you that there is another perspective. Of course and there is. And from that other that. perspective, science is a religion. Like, no. you know. Religion is by definition not a miracle. And science, by definition, is it's a miracle. system of beliefs. I mean, but, uh, but there are different systems of belief. I keep okay. expecting you to ask them to explain this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strong, strong belief. It's too much fun. I, and I doubt that they could. So. Um. But, you know, I, and, and humans aren't the only you know, species that have false confidence and false knowledge, right? So we have to also take into account that much of this is probably emerging from basic biological mechanisms. We see you can get animals to have false confidence and false beliefs as well. I don't know how much is known about sort of the social sharing of knowledge, uh, but certainly there are studies showing these sort of phenomena emerge in, in non-humans as well. And I think that's a really important 
aspect in terms of understanding, I think partly what you were referring to, sort of the physical and biological manifestations and, and mechanisms. And there's a big danger there if you take the, the rational context of, I have rational information, so I'm going to understand that. Uh, the, 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 the most beautiful way I ever uh, heard this expressed, I spent a lot of time talking to Gerald Edelman about selective uh, uh, systems in nature. And we believe it or not, we compared, uh, he would talk about, he first talked about his mind theory, but I said, can we go back to something empirical? <laughs> and can we go to um, your work on immune response? Because he had found the structure of the antibody. And, and so we had these great talks about comparing a magician and his audience uh, in, in doing tricks that could adapt, not stage tricks, but tricks where you're adapting very quickly, like almost uh, like three-card Monty on the street. So there's a, there's a very feedback and feed-forward response. So I was trying to explain this concept of selective processes in nature and uh, at a Mind Science Foundation conference, and, and there's a philosopher and a cognitive psychologist, and it wasn't happening. And then a wonderful woman, the, the secretary of the Mind Science Foundation, she came by and, and, I, and I said, well, let's put it in terms of nightclubs. And, and so this is getting into how does this information get specific, right? So if, and if you're thinking about, does it have to be rational? So I said, well, let's think about nightclubs, because at the time I was working at a big nightclub in New York. And, and I said, so if you walked into a nightclub, she was in her 20s, and I said, if you walked into a nightclub, you'd ignore me. And she said, no, I'd find out if you were an owner or a friend of the owner, and if you weren't, then I'd ignore you. <laughs> so I said, okay, this is the level of you know, reality I want to address. So then, so then I tried to explain this idea of selection, the selectional processes in nature. And she said, it's so obvious what he's saying. And, and the, the other people are going, what are you talking about? Because they kept on tr trying to fit it into a rational construct. And she said, listen, when I go to a nightclub at the beginning of the night, I know exactly who I'm looking for. I'm looking for Mr. Wright. But by the end of the night, when it's closing time, I'm looking for Mr. Right now. And all he's <laughs> and all he's saying is that nature can never choose. It can't deliberate. It can only select in terms of natural selection. She didn't say that a minute in it. Uh, the Mr. Right now. So if you, so once we shift from these areas of cognitive constructs of cognitive information and go to this animal stuff, it's good to think about ourselves in different contexts where we can appreciate selective processes in nature a little more easily. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's right. But I, I do think that there's a special status given to certain kinds of constructs that only humans are capable of. Yuval Harari has this great thought experiment, right? He, he asks you to imagine 50,000 chimpanzees sitting in the stadium watching a soccer match. Pure chaos, right? Complete chaos. You'd have animals jumping all over each other. There's something that humans are capable of there's a way that humans can interact with other humans that no other, I'd, I'll go this far, that no other cognitive mechanism is capable of. My, my joke, my, my, my quick response as I say, we've come to a point in society where we really believe that Mr. Spock must run the enterprise. And, 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 um, and right, because in other words, the sense of reason must lead. You know, and then we forget the reason why a morality play called Star Trek was written that showed the importance of our humanity. So all I'm saying is it's really... It's, yeah. no, I, the, I was not saying that we are led by reason. Right? Yeah. I was saying that we are able to collaborate as, as, as Wait, a that's group, the spot, as right. a community, the, in mean, a way that no other, no other cognitive systems can. That's the claim. So Wait. one thing we can do is share each other's intentionality. And, and Mike Tomasello has great arguments showing that no other animal, no other machine is capable of sharing intentionality with others. You're absolutely, and that is the whole Captain Kirk point, right? That he's, you can build a collective group that can do things beyond an individual capacity. Steve, I had a question. When you wrote your book, I'm sure, before Trump's election. Yes. Uh, the, the idea of a community, could there be two communities that do not communicate with each other? I mean, would you be writing the same book today? Oh, uh, well, I, I, I'd have a lot more examples if I were writing it today. But, but I, yes, the ideas would be the same. So one of our ideas is this notion of contagious understanding, right? We run experiments showing that when other people 
feel they understand, then you feel you understand more, right? Understanding is a bit like a disease. It's sort of, it's contagious. Um, and as a result of that, you can have ideological communities where individuals think they understand because the people around them understand, but everybody else understands because the people around them understand, and there's no actual understanding. Um, so when you have that kind of dynamic, you can certainly have multiple different ideological communities arising, right? Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of questions about what forms your community, and presumably we're all members of multiple communities, and there is nesting. You'd call of them communities of knowledge? Yeah. You don't like that? No, no, I, no. I like it a lot, but, <laughs> but you know, that you're using the word knowledge in a very different way yes, than it's being used yeah. by others if no, those are communities you know, that, of knowledge. That's one thing worth mentioning, just in order to calibrate the terminology. Yeah. Um, so, you know, typically we use words like knowing, understanding, uh, in factive senses, so that when you know, what you know has to be true. And when you understand yeah. what you understand, you really understand the, the, the principles by which the thing works. I think you, you just are, identified the difference between know. philosophers and psychologists. No, but you know, this really ought not to be, because this is terminology. Unless you, get, you just agree on the terminology, we'll just end up confusing one another. So this is, I mean, you're talking about on knowing, second. and we psychologists are talking about feeling that you know. Well, that's so, it. No, so you see, but in his, in his little it's speech just now, I don't mean to be the semantic police, here, but in the speech, there was constant sliding between feeling you understand and understanding. So is understanding contagious or is the feeling of understanding contagious? Mm. What you showed is the feeling yeah, of right. understanding is contagious because you then wanted to say there was no real understanding. That's true. I so, think this explains why biologists so often take a reductionist approach. Why so wow, much of the genetic code was worked out on simple animals because I could do the experiment today, show you the results, and you can replicate it tomorrow. So there is a level of science in certain areas in which we can show each other exactly what we do. The procedure is straightforward, and anyone else can do it and get very much the same result. So that has to be distinguished from the kinds of philosophical speculations we're talking about, in which you can have your belief and I have my belief, and we don't necessarily have to have coincidence of that. Mm -hmm. But there is hard science that is a prototype of what ultimately one tries to accomplish in a number of different areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think Steve's book, for example, is based on that sort of hard science yeah. about human subjective sense of knowing. Mm -hmm. right? Series of studies replicated. And it's not. It's not molecular science. It's behavioral science, but, but with the same, with the same, you know, yeah. the same, the same things working yeah. for it. Yeah. And it seems like, uh, I've heard you s s say in other meetings that you, this book is especially important for cognitive psychologists that can get in information. Uh, like I, I'm thinking of the historical note of when uh, um, Ulrich Neiser was trying to reframe cognitive psychology and kind of misunderstood, but he specifically brought up this kind of physical information as, as described by the Gibsons and uh, social schemata as, as described by Frederick Bartlett. Yeah, yeah. And, and it seems like you go into a similar territory and yeah, remind people yeah, that you need yeah. to open it up from just the pure cognitive. So one, one of the ideas is that as human beings, we're foragers for knowledge. And we don't retain a lot of it in our brains. We retain some of it in our bodies. We use the world all the time, right? Like, I don't know exactly where that bottle of water is, but I can look and see and reach for it. But more than anything, we use other people. And these days, of course, we use Google, which is a great source of knowledge. Uh, so, so this notion of embodiment, which I think you're referring to, right, that we use our bodies as part of the process of thought, we're sort of trying to generalize that to say we use other people as part of the process of thought as well. Let me, let me make this a little bit more concrete. So we have these gifted people all around here. Uh, I'm going to give you a task. If we want to put psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic theory, on an empirical basis, how would we proceed? What would you suggest are the first steps? <laughs> then if you want to do it? I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You need a Nobel Prize to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get the Nobel Prize for saying you didn't want to do that. He got it for doing what he did. Selection is important. 
People have tried, right? I mean, there are all sorts of studies looking at the effectiveness of psychoanalytic theory, of, of psychoanalysis. There are relatively few. When you consider how long the theory has been around, that there have been competing theories, there have been surprisingly few. Huh. Okay. Do you have an idea of what, uh, like, like a step-by-step, -step, like the next 10 years? Well, I think you'd have to think it through. But just for example, uh, under what circumstances is cognitive behavior therapy more advantageous compared to analytic therapy? That's something that's easily, I wouldn't easily, it's a stupid mm. word, but <laughs> should be possible to well, say. It has been studied. Yeah, yeah it has been not studied. Not extensively, not in a I mean, way that's Enough to show that one is far superior to the other. Yeah. I'd like to say something that perhaps is completely obvious um, here, right, which is that, and, and, and several of you have said in many contexts before, um, but might be worth um, reminding ourselves, which is, and it really comes from the perspective of us thinking about, you know, as everybody does, but my own work on memory and how we have to use memories to guide our behavior all the time. Um, we have to make fast decisions all the time. And so th that sense of confidence, the subjective sense of knowing that we know something, regardless of how that's influenced by other people, we couldn't act without that, right? This is, it's not like it's in our way and just leading us to make mistakes and, and really, you know, in, in, the, in the spirit of, of Danny and Amos's work, this is a fundamental necessity for survival is that subjective sense of belief. And without too much deliberation, Right, so you know, in many in many ways, it's it framed here as sort of something that's an illusion, but it's a, it's an illusion that serves us um, Sorry, what's an very illusion? well. The illusion of knowledge that we don't we can't all possibly always know in depth everything we think we need to know to act. I mean, a fundamental psychological result, I think, is that the experience of knowing is the same whether your knowledge is true or not. So, and you know, what we are concerned with here is the experience of knowledge, uh, of knowing. And it's a powerful experience associated with a powerful sense of confidence. And, and, and the fact that it doesn't necessarily correlate with truth is a very, very but, important fact but, but that we are taking but, as a fact. But don't you so think I don't think there is terminological confusion. But wait a I second, think we're really arguing about knowing as a state of mind, which you know can be, and reality is something else, and it can be connected or, or disconnected from reality. Um, well, it <laughs> I'm offending you. <laughs> no, no, no. It look, it's it's. We we can agree on the ter the terminology is easy to agree on. I mean, put it this way: the so, we, 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 way we usually think is knowing consists in part of the subjective aspect, which is believing with confidence and backed up probably by some reasons. And then the truth component, which is something we is not in our head and either obtains or doesn't obtain. So from a psychological point of view, though this is contested in some quarters, but we can surely agree on this, what matters for the explanation of behavior is the strongly held belief, the belief held with confidence, that's it. Whether it actually has the dyadic relational aspect of truth or not won't matter to how you behave. Um, and so that's... But we can reserve the term knowing for something that has the truth component and reserve the term reasonable or strongly held belief for the, for the state mm -hmm. of mind. Yeah. When you're at a restaurant and ordering from a menu, you're not going to say, I'll have the spaghetti because I have some reasonably, you know, reason, reasonable suspicion that that may be better. Right? You're, you're, you'll, you'll respond quickly and you'll place your order. First of all, that's order. a preference rather than a belief. I mean, but it's, a beef, it's a belief about the outcome of the choice. It, what you could, yeah, th I think presumably this is semantics. you do think, well, what is going to satisfy me at this moment? And then you make a selection wow. based on that. So that's based on reasons. But, but that's a belief about your own... What will make you happy? Yes, right. But I think it's very it's very similar um, in many ways, in the sense that you're making a prediction about the future based on something you're feeling, but you feel strongly about it, even though it's almost That's by definition kind I don't of think based on, on I don't, reason. I don't see any dispute here. Okay. Um, I tell you what is interesting is the something that. Well, I, sorry. well, let me just <laughs> quickly make a point that that may be obvious. You know, if I'm at a restaurant, often what I do is ask the waitress or the waiter, um, you know, would you, would you take the spaghetti? Mm -hmm. And if they say yes, then I'll go with it. And, and, and in general, <laughs> in general, I think many, are, many of our decisions are made out of habit. 
and many of our decisions are made because, you know, I was at a faculty meeting recently, and um, we were deciding whether to promote someone. And this colleague of mine said, you know, I didn't think this person should be promoted. I was right on the knife's edge, so I sat there and waited to see how other people voted, and I just went with the majority. And I actually think people do that all the time, right? Is this the norm? Is this what people do in this situation? That's the question we often ask ourselves. And so, so often we don't have reasons. Our reason is, this is what, this is what the community's doing. Well, but the reason. big difference with your that's colleague is that your colleague knew they didn't know. And what, right, in many ways, that's it, true. one of the most interesting phenomena is when people think they know and don't, right? Yeah. As you know, yeah. and now I'm quoting you to you. So. Right. <laughs> and implicit in what you're saying, I think, is trust in the community. But you know, I can't help looking around, and there are communities that are not talking uh, to each other, and they're at equal level of self-confidence, but communication is broken down. So there is no community of knowledge. And, and there is, well, you know, more science is not universally accepted. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and we're all living in communities of knowledge, it's just that there's more than one of them, right? I look around, I look to scientists and experts and people in this room, um, and there are other people in America who look elsewhere. It's actually an interesting question where they look, because it's not at all obvious. You had another point you wanted to make. I wanted to draw you out on this idea that uh, what, exactly what the dependence is on the community in knowing or thinking. Because, again, there is one fairly an familiar description of that that we started out with, where we rely on other people's knowledge, we accept what they say, we accept what they say. It's an interesting question on what basis, but, but uh, in an ideal situation, you would have some reason for trusting that source and trust it for that reason. You accept what they have to say. But you wanted something that's um, more um, a sexier thesis, that somehow the thinking itself is distributed. The thinking process is communally distributed. Did I understand you correctly? Yeah. The reasoning is distributed. Now that's a very... We're, I mean, the picture I described, we're, we're our individuals, we're reasoning for ourselves. Sometimes we outsource because we don't know everything and we want to rely on other people's thinking. But that thinking itself is conceived of as an individualistic thing which may have been borrowed from others. Yeah. But what is this idea of a distributed yeah. thinking? So the, the idea comes um, essentially from, from a, a colleague of yours, Hilary Putnam, the philosopher who talked about this in the domain of language, right? And he pointed out, often we use words, even though we, have, we don't know what they mean, right? So I, I might say something like, I, I hope one day to see a piece of molybdenum. And that's a perfectly good sentence, right? Even though I have no idea what molybdenum is. I just, I just believe there are experts in the community who could identify this. Um, and, and I think we use words like that all the time. You know, organic. What is it? This apple is organic. What does that really mean? <laughs> it, it means that we think there are people it's out there who, right? who, who, who could, you know, identify some lack of something. It's so, more expensive. <laughs> it's more expensive. That's true. Yeah. But that, so, that seems to so, fit with the, with, the, with the less sexy model, you see, because that's a case where well, what I am doing yeah. is I am deferring to a bunch of experts who really have criteria for identifying molybdenum or organic or something. Yeah, okay. And according to him, the way the attribution of concepts works in a community mm -hmm. is provided you are willing to defer to these experts, we attribute to you the full concept that they mm -hmm. have. You know, not the full understanding of that concept, mm -hmm. but the concept itself. So, but that looks like, it's not as though my reasoning is distributed over theirs, but rather I get to say I meant mm. molybdenum by molybdenum because I defer. Yeah. Uh, but you wanted something yeah, more. Look, I, I mean, um, I'm, I think I'm mostly happy with that. And okay. if it's not sexy, then, you know, okay. I'm not sexy. What can I say? <laughs> um, but I do think that there's a division of cognitive labor, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever we do almost anything, including crossing the street, 
there are, there are different jobs that are associated with different people, and mm -hmm. our perspective and our knowledge base is tiny, and yet things get done, right? We build communities like psychoanalytic communities, and we build iPhones, and we get to the moon because there's a lot of different expertise that's brought to bear on all the things that we do. So that's really the idea. Then it, seemed, it would be useful to think about people like craftspeople, in addition to people that work you know, on ideas and groups, like even you know, specific laboratory techniques or specific music techniques. Or, um, because you know, so I spent five years with a, a great master and there, of physical misdirection, and there was no way to learn those ideas quickly. And now what's really strange is because of YouTube, people assume that they can learn that kind of physical stuff faster. And it actually did take five years of rigorous training and, and then another, you know, several years just contemplating that. So there, there's different, it seems like there's different levels of that, those communities of knowledge and, and it seems like you could, you know, find, as you did in the book, but, but you, there's also, you could find more extremes. Um, like one of my favorite examples is a guy, um, George Basaka, who's been on previous panels, who um, is a master uh, panel conservator at the Met mm -hmm. and he did a 12 year apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. under very interesting circumstances. And, and the knowledge that he has is just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. His sense, the whole sense of time has changed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm dying to see an example. <laughs> um, we could, one quick example? Oh, yes. All right, <laughs> a quick trick. All right, that's what, we have little paper bags here. So, so the, the idea is, how do we confirm ideas that when we're talking together, we, we talk, just like we're talking right now, we confirm or not confirm ideas that we're sharing. But when we're in a physical space, we actually start, oh, I have a few, sorry. Ah. Um, so I just wanted to teach you a quick magic trick so that you can feel th these different ways of confirming. So and specifically, I'll be focusing on not the ideas as we're confirming and not confirming here, but just a f simple physical exercise. So. The, the simple idea, this will look strange from setting certain, uh, certain angles, but we're, so I'm going to explain it and then I'd love you to try it. The, the idea, so in, in any magic trick, there is basically a, a causal pattern that we want the audience to see and a causal pattern we don't want the audience to see. And they might be apparent, they might be real. That may, and because they're not all real, that means we can shift time in very interesting ways. So um, this is such a little experiment, and I'm going to ex expose this trick completely. It's a great clown trick, and it's something you can all do for your uh, friends and relatives. You, uh, you snap. If you can snap, it's easier. I can show you a method without that. And, and just wait one second. So what we're going to do is take a ball, throw it into the air, and catch the ball. So the whole idea is that we throw it up. We'll just stand up quickly so you can see. Oh. Okay. okay. You go like this. Like that, and, and like this, <laughs> right? Or like this, or you can do it, and if you can't, okay. okay. and just try to get that right. So just try, just try that for about 30 seconds, and try to catch the invisible ball in the bag so that it looks and feels right. I can't get a good snap. You got it. No. <laughs> That's a better way. No, this is a good thing I don't depend on this for my <laughs> Sorry, if you care. So, so you don't snap? I'm okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. That's good. Oh, uh, that's I see, you figured it you out. I that. figured just it out. Just hit it with a snap. I, I, I had actually Fired that amygdala, right? I see. Just like that. Oh, Give it a good shirt. That, that's the idea. Throw the ball out, and then you can't. Jam their amygdala. Like I see. All right. Sounds like the ball landed. Okay, so that's, oh, that's the first step. And did anybody have the feeling that they didn't do that so well? Okay, so, and, and this is an amazing thing. When we... When we're in the physical world, we have different ways of confirming. So we have ideas about what it should look like, and you can all feel that. It might not even be verbal. You might not be able to put all the details into a drawing for a researcher. But when it's right, how many of you got, when you'd nailed it a couple times, did you get that feeling of that felt good? That felt right? 
And we're like machines. We have these incredible powers of making, like, I'd love to see you work in the lab on the aplasia, like back when you were like digging in. Because when we get into that physical space, we're actually in a different part of ourselves that's really hard to remember in these conversations. So then we're going to do one more step and then go back to the, the uh, other kind of confirmation. But now I want you to confirm socially. So turn to the person next to you and then throw a ball to them and then have them right, throw what, the ball back to you. Share a ball, an invisible ball, with your neighbor. Okay, just try it for another 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. 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 So that's just that's an example of of different kinds that we can oh, <laughs> join in. <laughs> Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I'd like to apologize to the entire panel. <laughs> well, and we're learning something. The other thing that we're learning is when we, when we engage physically and socially, it's really fun. I, I was just at Columbia um, and walking down the street, and there's a new game store where you go in and people are playing games. It's electric. You go in and you just see what we just all felt. Mm -hmm. When we play together, we bond and we have this kind of collective knowledge mm -hmm. and it's almost mm -hmm. instant. It's, it's amazing. We don't have to instantiate this in all kinds of verbal description, but what you can feel it almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. You have another? What did you say? Another example. <laughs> oh, sure, whatever you want. <laughs> Danny was having fun. I think. Okay, okay, you're a joke. Quick card yeah. trick? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, okay. Opening for questions. Okay, you just have to go to the speaker. Just ask a question. Yes. Please. I would like your comments on pluralistic ignorance. I think it's relevant here. If you want me to read a definition, I, I can. Okay. It's in social psychology. Pluralistic ignorance is a situation where a majority of group members privately reject a norm, but incorrectly assume that most others accept it and therefore go along with it. It's also described as no one believes, but everyone thinks that everyone believes. In short, it's a bias about a social group held by a social group. Yeah. Um, it is relevant, and, and it's a powerful phenomenon, uh, especially these days. Um, and I, I, I really believe that it, it falls right out of the kind of analysis I was proposing earlier, where people's sense of understanding comes from the sense of understanding that others have. And so if there's this norm that says, you know, we as a group believe X, then even if most of the group doesn't believe X, you're going to have this sense of understanding that X is true. And people don't, there's, right. So the only way to know about it is to sort of have a vote, is to have a public open discussion about whether people do in fact accept X. So, and, and that's why, um, you know, demo, deliberative forums are so important, right? To bring this kind of knowledge, to, to make it public. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, why did people evolve this way with this seemingly error-prone system? Uh, and what does the panel think of the argument of theory of reasoning that says that the reason we are, we're this way is that reasoning wasn't developed to be right, but was to win arguments? So he, you're referring to the Hugo Mercier yeah. and Dan yeah. Sperber theory of argumentation. Yeah. Ed? 
<laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, we, we evolved in groups, right? And there's always been a division of cognitive labor. We, you know, we have our own little specialties, and and we take positions, and by virtue of having group discussion, you're going to have multiple positions put forward. Um, you know, I think the one thing that that theory gets wrong is the notion that we spend a lot of time arguing. Yeah. I, I, I think philosophers spend a lot of time arguing, but I, I think <laughs> most people spend their time telling stories. Right. I think we live in a really perilous time where we have these communities of experts that are riven and we're not speaking to each other. And to some extent, I wonder to what extent you believe that the sort of postmodern concept of truth that we all studied in college, I certainly did, that everything is socially constructed and that, uh, that, that, that there's no way to get between language and its object and that in, a, in essence truth is malleable has contributed to the world we're living in today which we can call post-truth, where there is no reality testing. That's a, um, that's a very important uh, observation and question. You know, one of the things I keep uh, telling some of my journalist friends is I'd really like them to study where Kellyanne Conway went to school and what courses she took, because I find it very hard to believe that somebody could get on national TV and use the notion of an alternative fact without this having been validated for her by various postmodernist professors coming down the line. Now, this thing, you have to understand, this idea that there is no such thing as the truth, but the truth is only perspectival, and so there can be alternate truths and alternate facts. This is something, before it was championed by the, by the extreme right, was championed by the left. And it's been orthodoxy in universities and social sciences and the humanities for the last 40 years. And there is no doubt that this has had a follow-on effect because these kids go, they graduate, they go into civil service, they go into government, and suddenly you're seeing them use it uh, in, in, you know, in some of the most dangerous possible ways to rebut climate change science, to rebut even size of an inauguration crowd by simply appealing to the idea that, well, everybody has their own truth. So um, I completely agree with you. I think uh, this has been the root of a lot of evil. And it originated with the left and has migrated to the right for obvious reasons, and that is that relativism about truth is symmetric. If it can be used by the left, as it were, to insulate people from criticisms from the right, it can also be turned around and used the other way. So. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist with a particular interest in the science of spirituality, and I wanted to ask you, today we're talking about cognitive illusions and how by virtue of being human, we often fall prey to these cognitive illusions. And I wanted your thoughts in particular on the idea of consciousness, because there's a paradigm shift happening very slowly um, from the materials point of view where the brain creates consciousness to a point of view where consciousness creates the brain, where consciousness is primary. And I'm curious what the points of view are on that. <laughs> I, think, I think several of us just don't accept your premise that, you know, that things are developing that way. <laughs> I have nothing to say. <laughs> I mean, I think people, people like Stanislav Dehan are trying to study now under what circumstances material becomes conscious. And you can easily imagine experiments that will allow you to explore that. <clears throat> if I take an image of you and show it to Daphne very transiently, um, she will perceive it on some level, but she won't be consciously aware of it. If I show the same image for a longer period of time, she will be aware of it. And if you now do imaging experiments under those two circumstances, you see with the brief exposure, only the temporal lobe is activated. And that with a longer exposure, the information propagates to other areas of the brain and is utilized effectively by it. So one component of moving from unconscious to consciousness is the information becomes available to larger areas of the brain. They can then use it effectively. But this is a very early primitive understanding of a component of consciousness. 
Simple example. And, and I, I also think, the, like thinking more clearly about selectional processes in nature is helpful, so that it doesn't fit into this either or category. And, and I also really love some of the experiments by Olaf Blanca at EPFL, where, where for in terms of social uh, consciousness approach that you might like. One of the really interesting things that has been, you know, around since Freud, uh, and Ernst Chris was very much interested, is to what degree there's easy communication between unconscious and conscious processes. You know, Chris's idea of regression in the service of the ego, that is part of creativity, is having easy access to one's unconscious processes. And to some degree, I don't know whether you, this is what you were talking about before, you go home and you think about something and boom, all of a sudden it comes to you in a moment of relaxation. So that may involve something like that. It would be very interesting to understand exactly how that occurs. My question is, is there a clear distinction between what we believe and what we know? And if there is, then what is it? You better ask him. He, he has the answer to that one. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Any? You know, it, it really depends whether you're a psychologist or a, or a philosopher. I mean, uh, but you're both. I, I, no. Uh, You know, we use the word knowledge for a belief that happens to be true. You know, that's the, that's the condition for the use of the word, if you want to be precise about the terminology. Oh, the belief itself, as we seem to be agreeing around the table, the belief is the subjective state is actually the same. And, and the question that separates belief from knowledge is whether it's true or not. If that, yeah, I mean, I would also add the component of, uh, of, of justification. Um, so, you know, you can have a, a, a belief that's based on a hunch or a guess, uh, which may or may not be true. So, but we wouldn't call that knowledge. You know, suppose you think, um, I'm going to win the lottery. You know, and then you, lo and behold, you do win the lottery, but you had zero reason to believe that. It's not like it was rigged in your favor. We wouldn't say he knew that he was going to win the lottery. You know, or if you do, well, sometimes we do say that. Subscripted, <laughs> subscripted. You know, all of this is just—it really is terminology. That is, is, we can we know how to make the distinctions between the notions that we think are important, and then we use the words to make sure that we express ourselves. So, there's belief, there is justified belief, belief that is really based on some good evidence that you're aware of, and then there is justified belief that have also true. We reserve the term knowledge for the thing that has all three properties. So I can believe that there may be extraterrestrial beings, but I can't say that I know that there are. Right, yeah. you can't because, and there may be, right. but you That's can't say it because you don't have evidence. That's what he said. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so let me, th I, that is clearly how philosophers make the distinction. Let me hypothesize that psychologists use a more sort of ordinary language way ah. of making the distinction which is really just a degree of consensus, right? So yeah. if, if there are very few people who, who also have that uh, yeah, thing, yeah, then yeah. we call it a belief. Whereas if everybody agrees, then we call it knowledge. You know, the most, uh, the, the, there is that. This tricky. is what's known as the notion of a widely accepted claim. Okay, it's widely accepted within the community. And in fact, most people, they don't only conflate that with knowledge, they conflate it with truth. Uh, so, you know, people say, right. you know, so that's why you that's get, even, have, even in uh, journalism, yes, this is a crucial, this is a crucial error. Um, <laughs> this is why you get in, in journalists, for instance, they say, is evolution a fact or is it just a theory? Now, that's a very weird question for a philosopher, but it's not if you think by fact you mean widely accepted claim. So you're asking, is this a widely accepted claim or is it just an opinion that some people have? That makes sense. But there are very strong reasons for not conflating widely accepted claim with truth and widely accepted claim with knowledge, okay? I can give you the reasons, but uh, as I say, at the end of the day, this is merely keeping the terminology clear. We know the distinctions. Uh the word intuition is interesting in this context because the word intuition is frequently defined as knowing without knowing why you know. Right. You know, that's the standard definition of intuition that you find. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I find that very difficult to accept. Um, and um, I suppose this is true for everybody around the table. But 
But it is a very widely accepted notion that you can know without knowing what you know. And that, and that it's a, there is a subjective state of knowing without knowing what you know. Uh, and this is very common in everyday language. And it's quite powerful. And, and in part, when psychologists use you know, the terminology that, that you were objecting to, I think, when we use that terminology, it's, it's influenced by that, that knowing is really a subjective state. Um, so I hope my question will be a good follow-up on this. Because uh, the thing I think you, you didn't really mention is that I, and fascinates me, is the human's capacity to actually sort between what you, I mean, what you described as like concrete empirical knowledge and that other domain of knowledge where you extrapolate, project, trust others. I find it fascinating, for instance, that um, the member of a tribe who knows that there are spirits behind any leaf or tree or, or river, when they want to make a boat, they know they have to carve a tree a particular way so that it floats. They don't confuse the two domains, right? Those who built the cathedral, who believed that angels were holding the world, they knew the equation so that the walls of the cathedral would stand. And even today, the people who think that you know, the Trump supporters who think that a wall is going to stop Mexican rapists to enter the United States, they know when their car, their car breaks that they have to operate on a different mode. So, so behind those two domains of knowing that seems to be pretty universal, don't you think there is a human capacity to actually, in most cases, orient ourselves in a pretty accurate way? For one thing, if you're in the physical world and you make a boat that doesn't float, you find out really quickly it doesn't float. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're, pointing, uh, what you're pointing out, and again, this will be controversial among the psychologists, is that there is a much greater use of reason operative guiding people um, than, you know, sometimes they're given credit with. And this shows up in these small ways. You know, it shows up in countless ways in which we navigate the world, uh, including f you know, reaching for the bottle in the right way, because that's part of knowledge. It's part of perceptual knowledge. And then, of course, your boat example is a more sophisticated example of the same thing. So you're absolutely right. There are huge domains of behavior that's simply taken for granted where people operate in, in completely rational ways. And then they sort of quarantine that off from areas which are less constrained by evidence, where they believe what they wish to believe rather than what is justified. So, so can I, My can question I, specifically was, do you think there yeah. is a psychological function? Like, I'm like really talking science here. Oh. I guess it's, it seems I to see. me that it, 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 Well, the psychological function is obvious. As I say, you'll drown if you build the boat the wrong way. So you, sure. So I, I, I understood your last question differently. I thought you were asking whether it's possible to be accurate, whether you can always um, know whether your theories about what's going on are I right or wrong. In, the, in, in these two domains, there is, a, there is a, a surprising wisdom behind where people know actually when they can afford one domain of knowledge right. and mm -hmm. audio. So, so can I just make a quick observation about that? Um, George Bernard Shaw wrote in the preface to his play, St. Joan, in 1924. He, he argued that the people who followed Joan of Arc because of her ability to speak to archangels and prophets, that those people were no less rational and no less correct in their behavior than the soldiers who followed the generals in World War I. Because in both cases, people were operating based on faith, right? Faith that the people who were leading them knew what they were doing, that the weapons that they had constructed were going to work, right? That there was, there was, at the time, and even more so today, a science that we can't possibly understand, right? So when people are pressing buttons to shoot people or drop bombs today, they don't understand the technology. Very few people understand the technology. So invariably, we have to rely on faith, right? And invariably, I think, therefore, there's got to be a kind of uncertainty. This is very dangerous. This is very dangerous. 
Well, I don't know if it's dangerous. I think it's accurate. Can I just, I mean, I, I interpreted the question in yet a slightly different way. <laughs> uh, so you know, it speaks to the nature of consensus in, in knowledge mm -hmm. um, about different ways of knowing and that they can coexist. Um, and very yeah. simply from the, my neuroscience perspective, cognitive neuroscience perspective on this, that's true. <laughs> we know <laughs> scientifically that we know things in a lot of different ways. And our assumption from our discipline is that the, re the reason for it, if there is one, is that you need to know things in many different ways and that ultimately an action will be driven you know, by, by one system or representation rather than another. But that it would be that that's important because you don't know in the moment what kind of knowledge will be the most useful. But what that does create is a system of sort of parallel, slightly misaligned kinds of ways of knowing um, that, make, you know, that, that might add robustness and resilience, but of course add complication as well. Daphne, maybe you can elaborate on, on the separation between cognitive knowledge and, and motor knowledge. Right, this is, I mean, yes. Because that's such a good example of, of yeah, what you're no, describing. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know, so one of the, um, one of the kind of famous, well-known examples in the brain are the different separate circuits for uh, remembering what Eric and I spoke about at our last meeting last week. Um, and there's a very separate way of knowing what, uh, remembering what, uh, let's say, er, the, the content of, of the information um, and its flavor and a separate way of knowing how to open the door when someone comes to visit you. And th those are so separated out that you can have patients with damage to different parts of the brain. And each of those different ways of knowing can either be independently impaired or intact. Right, so these are kind of everyday examples of this multiplicity of, of, of systems of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Hi. <laughs> I'm a bit shorter. Mm -hmm. um, my question has to do with um, before earlier when all of you were talking about kind of uh, where we get our knowledge from, how do we decide um, what can be trusted. So. Um, I was wondering if any of you could comment on um, kind of the trustworthiness of, or how much trust can we put in empirical knowledge when so much of our empirical studies are, so to speak, weird. So Western, educated, industrialized. I um, can't remember what the other one is, but <laughs> um, democratic and, oh, wealthy, well, rich. Uh, maybe, uh, just a, a kind you of a should. comment on the question, in, in, in a sense. I think there, there are two. I, th I thought you were headed one place, and then you ended up somewhere else, but I think they're both maybe relevant. And one is first, you know, amongst us, we assume that the empirical method of scientific inquiry is the way forward, and it has to be done well. <laughs> and I think you re really the rest of your question was, about, well, how do, we, how do we know we're doing it well and that it's relevant for understanding humanity more broadly, given the, the constraints of, the, of, of the, the research people like us do, is that, is that correct? Yeah, well, because um, you guys were just commenting on um, thinking you know, and how do we get our em actual empirical evidence to truly reflect not just what we think we know and not just necessarily reconfirming what we already know, but actually taking it a step further. Yeah, so you know, I, I don't think I have, I don't, maybe others have something more interesting to say. I think all I can say is we we, we do the, we do the best we can with with the science we do, and we can be doing better. And there are efforts towards that. I don't know if Danny's. Oh. I mean, also, also you know, we not, think that there's not a consensus in the scientific community. So, you know, one of us may come up with some idea. Somebody else in the field may have an opposite idea. May challenge you. So there are challenges going on in the scientific community all the time mm. that give you certain more confidence in certain ways of thinking than in others. I had a recent experience that uh, I think is relevant to the question. I, was, I got an email from two scientists uh, who wanted to talk to me about climate change and how to uh, educate people on the truth of climate change. And we arranged for lunch and we met for lunch. And one of them is a member of the National Academy, another one with the head of the New York Academy of Sciences. 
and there are climate change deniers, which just never occurred to me. Mm. Uh. And they want to find ways of educating people in the truth. Mm -hmm. They can Trump. And, and what, what happened, you know, was that I was challenged. Uh, it, it's actually quite interesting in terms of the science, what you would advise people like those to do. And, you know, I, I suggested that they publish <laughs> what we call an adversarial collaboration, that they try to, to have a conversation, public conversation with, with opponents. But what I was challenged by is why do I believe in, in climate change? And of course, I believe in climate change for exactly the same reason that many other people don't believe in climate change, because I believe in people who believe in climate change. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's it. Yeah. There's really nothing beyond that. I don't even, you know, the, the sense that I understand climate change, I know that I don't understand enough to win an argument with somebody who doesn't believe, like those two scientists who were telling me that carbon dioxide is a beautiful thing. <laughs> but is it, really a, is it really as circular as that, you know, that I, I believe in climate change because I believe in people who believe in climate change? I mean, there I, are, there no, no, are, I, I hope that there are some people at the end of the chain who know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, no, I, I, I understand. I'm saying even in your own case, is it quite as vacuous as that? Isn't it that they, the people that you trust have other qualities that make you trust them more, and therefore, since they're trustworthy in general, they're also trustworthy on this particular topic. That's completely circular. I mean, I, I trust why, people with PhDs records. and members of the National Academy. Well, I believe basically in climate change, if we ask ourselves, because the National Academy of Sciences, in its majority, believes in climate change. Well, but that's, and I that's, believe in the National Academy of Sciences. You know, that's, no. this is not a very strong argument for believing in climate change. You well, can believe bad. in I lots don't, of I things. Don't, I, don't, yeah. that's, I don't think that's right, uh, because those it's are, evidence. you know, you can, you can keep it's pushing the question evidence. further and further back. Suppose somebody were a skeptic about admission to the National Academy and so on and so forth. Suppose one were a skeptic about empirical method in general. I agree. Once they've pushed it that far, you may have trouble giving answers. But the proximate reason why you believe in climate change or why you believe that smoking causes cancer, why you believe any of these things that you yourself haven't done studies for, is you have good reason to trust the people you trust and not merely because of their views about that particular topic. It's a much more general reason to be trusting of that particular body. That's true uh, on the other side as well. And that's true in communist, it's not, it's that's they, true in totalitarian societies. You know, What's it's true, true in a lot of places societies. where what is believed that the end of the train isn't true. Oh, right. That's a very right. radical skepticism, okay, right. which, which means that if you keep pushing it back, you will reach a point where your, uh, your answers are circular. But it does matter where they get to be circular. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I, I, I take Paul to be saying that you believe that members of the National Academy of Science are telling the truth about climate change because they In also general, were able yeah. to send people to the moon, right? And they were also able to right. build incredible electronic equipment, etc. So there's independent, there's a network of knowledge that they accept and are part of, and that's good reason to believe them, that's even good. if you don't know anything about climate change. But the, you can still be skeptical, I guess. Yes, I mean, there are I mean, skepticism. So I met open. those two scientists for lunch, and it didn't change my belief about climate change <laughs> at all. Right. And you know, it's not that I was shaken because here are two reputable scientists yeah. who who don't believe in climate change. I stayed with my beliefs, and and that I think is very common. Sure, because we know ninety-seven percent of scientists <laughs> yeah. believe yes. in climate change. Right? <laughs> Um, I think my question may follow on, on this one. We are in, at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute and Society, and it would seem from the discussion so far that everybody has accepted the notion, Dr. Kandel, that psychoanalysis is simply passe and unscientific. I no, 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 no. I'm saying that question, that question has never been examined. Well, I, I would like to challenge you on that. Okay. If, first of all, my dissertation over 50 years ago was an empirical study using subliminal, I, I'm a psychologist, using subliminal perception and tachistoscopes, and we found results. But it's not just from 50 some odd years ago. If you Google psychoanalytic empirical research, you will get over 500,000 hits 
not all of them of the same quality. But uh, the late Benjamin Blatt at Yale, Howard Chevron at Michigan, and others I can name have been doing long-term studies, and at your own university, there are studies going on that are empirical studies that seem to support the idea that I, like you, am a scientific person. I believe in the scientific values that have been discussed here, but not in the exclusion of psychoanalysis, nor in the diminution of the empirical, non-clinical empirical research efforts that have supported it for over 50 years, not in any way conclusively, and showing many limitations, but it's a science. I guess that's more of a statement than a question. Yeah. Statement of faith. <laughs> um, I don't have a question per se, but I do. Such a quick comment, quick. Uh, in terms of the use of religion, uh, religion is defined in the dictionary as belief in a transcendental or metaphysical being. I think the way the word was thrown around here was um, um, inappropriate or, or misused, and I just wanted to make that comment. Um, the other thing about animal sentience, there have been over 2,500 studies to date on the fact that many animals, from elephants at the high end to fish, certain fish, at the low end, if there is a low end, um, have indeed. Um, what? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, uh, that sentience is has been found uh, unequivocally amongst non-human beings. That's all. That's been found. Sentience has been found in animals. Sentience, consciousness. Sentience. Yeah. No disagreement. So, I want to ask. Um, <laughs> I'm a general internist, and I was thinking as, as you were talking about um, how we know things about a, a case that I was confronted with, and what I really wanted to ask about is how do we communicate between each other when knowledge, when, our, when what we know is different. And I saw a patient, she was 19, and she had something called conversion disorder, at least I think, where she knew she couldn't move her arm. And I can take some pictures and look, and I know, at least I think, that she can move her arm. And what I think we're all confronted with now, when I think she can move her arm and she thinks she can't move her arm, is, well, now what do we do to How do we speak to each other? How do we try to bridge that gap? And I think that uh, I wonder what the, the, the thoughts are of this group of how do we bridge that gap and talk to each other. Psychoanalysis. <laughs> so can I probe you a little bit? Yes, so, so did you engage with her and, and try to use the scientific method? So did I did you? what I think many of us would do, and I went to my mentor and I said, you have more experience with this than I do. What do I do with this person? Uh -huh. And he told me, he said, and I guess maybe this is another type of religion, it became one of my religions, sort of, was to say, just tell her you think it's going to get better. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to I confront see. I see. I see. the different belief systems that are causing this block between you and say, I, I don't know why you can't move your arm exactly. I can't see on a picture, but I think it could get better. And so that's what I did, and it didn't get better. I see. As but, far as I know. So you supposed. didn't try showing her a video of herself moving her arm? I did not. Or, or why, ask her why, to pick up a glass of water. And I think this gets to a little bit of the point that was raised before, that I'm trying to have empathy. Uh -huh. To say, yes, I understand that you're having this problem, and I, I believe that you believe that you can't move your arm, and so maybe we can move beyond it and talk about something else. I don't know, but it wasn't solving the problem. It certainly wasn't solving the problem. Thank you. You can tell a lot about a person by asking, what's your favorite joke? Here's my favorite joke. The rabbi is sitting in the kitchen, the Yiddish table, <laughs> and his wife is making soup. There's a knock at the door. 
Rabbi says, come in. Two men come in. They say, we have a business dispute. Could you solve it? Rabbi says, sit down. First man gives his story. The rabbi says, you're right. Turns to the second man. Second man gives his story. The rabbi you're says, right. you're right. His wife throws down the soup spoon and says, how can he be right and he be right? The rabbi says, you're right too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I've been doing analysis for, you know, 45 years in this hallowed institution. And when I was taught, originally, I was taught by people who did feel they had the revealed truth. I think for the last 25 years, what I have been teaching is different. And here's an example of a case. 10 years ago, a man came to see me. He couldn't get a date, he couldn't hold down a job, and he was really depressed about this. 10 years later, he's married, empirical fact. I saw the, birth, the, 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 the uh, marriage certificate. <laughs> he's got two children, empirical fact. I've seen pictures of them. And he's got a job, because that's how he can pay me at my exorbitant rate every month. <laughs> so what I know is that all those changes have taken place. What I do not know, and confess to this ignorance, is how did it happen? Is it because I thoroughly analyzed his Oedipal complex, which I did? Is it because I analyzed his um, masochism, which I did? <laughs> is it because I've treated him in a respectful, interested way for 10 years? which I did, is it some communication between our mutual unconsciousnesses that neither of us knows anything about? So what I know is that the process works. And I have 40 instances like this. Um, what I don't know is how and why it works. How would one, how would one study that? Sir, sir, don't leave. How, would, how do you know it works? How do you know it works? Yeah. How would one study that? I don't know it works. What? The process of therapy. How would one study why it works? I think it would be really hard. But, I think you could well. study that it works. One of the reasons I think that cognitive behavioral therapy works is the quality of the relationship between the patient and the Therapy. physician. Because some people, they can do it and it really works, and other people, it falls flat on its face. I know an instance where a little girl was sent to a CBT after having had a uh, dynamic therapist, and after about half a dozen sessions, she turned to the therapist and said, could we please talk about my family? I think that's where the problem is. Uh, I mean, I'd like to draw one distinction between CBT and what you described, is that CBT is based on controlled trials, and where you take patients and some of them get treatment and others don't get treatment, and you look at the, at the level of improvement after a while. What you did not tell us, what you did not examine, was the possibility that the person's success in life and children and job and so on had nothing to do with you. All the hypotheses that you mentioned were hypotheses about, uh, that assumed that your interaction caused the changes in that person's life. And it's that assumption that many people question. You're right, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm an undergrad studying neuroscience and philosophy at Columbia University. 
Um, and my question concerns imagination. So um, Einstein, for example, um, with, when he was coming up with his theory of relativity, he had this assumption that, that gravitational waves exist. And this was only proven, I mean, we only detected gravitational waves a few years ago. And there was this leap of faith involved. And there was this imagination. He pushed boundaries. He pushed, um, he questioned and challenged the scientific paradigms of his time. And my question is, what is the role of imagination in his knowledge? Because I'm sure he knew that that was the theory of relativity was, an, was how the universe uh, was um, worked, or how the universe was composed. Well, um, you know, the, first of all, he, he tried to publish a paper proving that gravitational waves don't exist in the 1930s. So uh, it was a consequence of his theory that they exist, but in fact, he thought it was a bad consequence, and he tried to. <laughs> tried to, had a fallacious argument for uh, mm. trying to show that it didn't follow. But the real, the question you're asking, I mean, there are these incredible creative breakthroughs. And creativity in general is a very, very difficult thing to understand because what we understand, the way we understand things is to see what the principles are that operate and how, when those principles are when, when the mechanism is working correctly, things follow from that. But creative breakthroughs precisely are things that break the rules. Um, and so it, 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 it is, I don't know if a theory, the psychologist should tell us what the latest thinking is about creativity, but as far as I know, we're very much in the dark about that. I think this is an, an extreme example in yeah. many ways, and a very beautiful one, yeah. but I think of how we all do this all the time. I think in many ways it's really kind of the essence of part of this conversation and very relevant, which is you know, both, both in the scientific realm, uh, but in general, here we are talking about doubts and suspicion and empirical data. We all feel very strongly about some of our ideas, right? And we have to, to get through the next grant cycle and study um, and all the obstacles we face as scientists. We have to feel strongly and, and have a lot of confidence in those ideas. And yet, simultaneously, we have to know that that's a little bit of an illusion and, and keep pushing for it. And I, th I think that it's something that everybody has to do all the time. Um, to get up in the morning yeah. and to work hard at anything requires a strong sense of belief and confidence. And yet to do it in a way that's intelligent and cautious requires, at the same time, knowing that we might be wrong. And it really gets at this idea of sort of multiple representations happening um, also simultaneously. Also you, you have the feeling that, you know, this has worked before, this line of thought. So it's likely to work again in the future if I run additional control. So you have a little historical background with it. It gives you confidence in the fact that you're moving in the right direction. But just one little historical correction. You know, the, the confirmation for general relativity didn't just come now with the discovery of gravitational waves. It came in 1917 right. with the observation of the uh, bending of, yeah. So, you know, it's not as though, you know, we've had this confident, great confidence in general relativity for 80 years, and suddenly, it's with some slight confirmation, the confirmation came early on. Shirley Muller, neurologist. A few questions ago, someone asked a question, and several of you interpreted it differently. This <laughs> question was the same. So this would be because of genetics, education, environment, how you interpreted the context and so on. Would this not get down to organicity, as you suggested? And is not the real grain of salt in what we're talking about today, which is fake knowledge versus illusion of knowing, having to do basically with the organicity in our brain, the processes? I, I You're looking at the neuros one of the neuroscientists on the panel. I mean, there's a but I don't think anybody else would disagree, even, even the psychoanalysts, right? That's, it, it, it all comes down to brain mechanisms in the sense that it involves brain mechanisms, not that that necessarily but explains it But I'd like to hear away. you discuss it more, because to me that was what was missing today, this concrete information. That's what I'm asking for. Um, well, I'm, I, I, you know, I could give, I, I could say a lot <laughs> about the brain. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I know how to answer that, and maybe Eric. Well, I think w one of the things that I think would benefit the field a great deal <clears throat> if there was more of a bridge between brain science and psychoanalysis. I'll give you an example. There's a woman called Helen Mayberg, who is a neurologist, actually. She's been interested in depression 
and she's been able to localize regions with imaging that are involved in depression, and then see to what degree there's a loss of those abnormalities when patients respond therapeutically, and she has tried different therapies. So there are beginnings in this direction. So to take various kinds of psychiatric illnesses, begin to identify the neuroanatomical substance. It's a very difficult problem. But to begin to do that and to see which change with which kind of therapeutic approaches is clearly the next step in our field for the next, you know, 15, 20 years. I think, you know, in addition to that, there, there's certainly um, a good amount of evidence into kind of what's happening in the brain when you're creating some false memories, for example. Um, so we actually know how that plays out. And, and, you know, it's only us from the outside who would call these things false memories. But connecting memories to each other, and we know how, more or less, how the brain does that, how the brain sort of creates associations. And those are things, as we mentioned earlier, that are necessary for many aspects of behavior. I, th I think this is just sort of one, several examples of extreme consequences. But I think, I think we, we actually know a fair amount about what's happening in the brain. And I think there's this very interesting disconnect between that level of understanding and really being able to explain these phenomena at the level of society and know what to do about them. Um, so that there's, there a, there's a lot of tension There are actually some around. cases in which one is beginning to do that. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's emerged that when people age, in addition to being susceptible to Alzheimer's disease, there's a milder form of memory disorder called euphemistically age-related memory loss, uh, which is quite different from Alzheimer's. It involves different regions of the brain. Uh, you can develop animal models of that as well. And you can see where this occurs and actually find that there are certain therapeutic approaches to it. For example, there is a hormone released from bone called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin reverses age-related memory loss. And you can show in, in an experimental animal that as they have age-related memory loss, if you now exercise them more, if you have them work their bones more by walking more, you can reverse that. And that's related to the amount of osteocalcin that's produced. And this may contribute to why people who exercise a lot, as continue to exercise as they age, tend to do better in terms of their cognitive performance. So we're beginning to get some clues from these combination of approaches that are useful. Actually, do you want to do a quick card trick? <laughs> <laughs> OK, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's end. Sure, okay. one, one big, uh, so. Like, here we go. Uh, <laughs> I want to learn how you to just, do this. I want to leave today oh, being here. a magician. You should do it. No, 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 no. No, no here. Hold I, I just happen to have a deck of cards with it. Here, hold the cards in your hand. <laughs> and then, uh, and if you would be so kind to just uh, think of a card and then change your mind a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> and think of another card. So this way you don't you even know. Him. Yeah. Uh, so, me? Yeah, oh, if you would. Okay. Right? So think of one card and then change your mind a couple of times to get past all bias. And <laughs> we'll see if this works. Okay, and then say the card out loud so we can all hear it. Ace of spades. Are you That's serious? exactly what I thought. Seriously. I swear. <laughs> I really mean that. <laughs> I can read his mind. <laughs> Let's give him a big hand. That's what I, mean. <laughs> I can read his mind. Okay, okay. But wait, wait. We'll go further. By, uh, by highest <laughs> scientific accomplishment, reading your mind. <laughs> okay. But wait, it gets better. Could you deal out cards right here? Uh, and just, could you spell Kahneman, right? With these cards. So, and just, so put a card Spelling down test. and it goes K. You know, so put a card down over there and spell K. Okay, or, or face down. It makes it more dramatic, right? Okay, that's K and then A. H N E M oh. Oh. A N. Right. Oh, no, that's good. That's good. N. Uh, oh, just, just one N, right? Just one N. Oh, one that's N. really important. Okay. So, could can you see in these cards the last one that you placed down on the table? Could you turn that card over and we can only hope? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it, the ace of spades. <laughs> You're really good at this. <laughs> you fix the deck. If you fix the deck. <laughs>
<laughs> well worked out. <laughs> He's the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. You did very well. Well, I did what you fixed me to do. <laughs>